yeah, I think we're good to we're good to go. Yeah, great. Thanks, you. So welcome everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, Kieran Mila Falsha, as we say in Irish, because uh, we have uh, not just uh, our Irish guests, but a lot of international guests. So you're all very welcome to Art and the Rights of Nature. And this uh, symposium, um, we're calling it a symposium, but really what we'd like to think of it is it's a conversation. And, and this conversation this evening, uh, it comes out of uh, the exhibition that's currently on at the Baron College Park Gallery, and that is the exhibition No Man's Land by artist Hugh Pocock, who is, is with us here. Um, for our audience who are here in person, if you've not had a chance to see the exhibition yet, I, I totally recommend it you, you do and you spend some time with it. And if you're joining us uh, via, via Zoom, and if you're in the area or in the region, I would really urge you to uh, to visit the college and visit the exhibition for us from as well. So uh, a couple of just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the exhibition is, is our bar and annual exhibition uh, that takes place. This is the first time now in, in, since before COVID. We had this exhibition planned in 2020. It was cancelled. It was planned again for last year. It was cancelled again. So it's been a long time uh, in, in the offing and we're delighted to be able to, to host it and this discussion is part of it. And uh, just a quick uh, thank you uh, to the Burn College of Arts staff who supported with the exhibition as well. My colleague, Lisa, who's worked with uh, publicity and uh, Adam and Robert, our technicians who are, are not with us, but I just want to give them an acknowledgement as well and about this evening. And I also want, want to acknowledge uh, a huge collaboration or a partnership with, with, with Keith Woods. Uh, and Keith uh, is, is part of our panel tonight, and you, you'll be hearing from Keith shortly. And Keith is, is a Paheke, if I'm pronouncing that right, Keith, uh, of the Nati Rangi people uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And he is joining us uh, from Aotearoa um, very early in the morning, uh, his time, so it's at 4 a.m., I think. So, uh, but you'll be hearing more from Keith shortly. Um, but Keith has a video piece uh, in the exhibition in the gallery it's also connected via you can you can download it or you can link to it through your phone so uh, this is an important part of the exhibition as well and we're delighted to be able to to welcome Keith to be part of the conversation uh, this evening too so um just a, a, in terms of housekeeping I would just ask you if you're in the audience if you wouldn't mind putting your phone on silent or switching it off and I would ask if you're joining us from on zoom um, if you're an audience participant in Zoom, that if you wouldn't mind muting yourself uh, or clicking the mute button in Zoom as well. So I don't I think unless I've left anything out, <laughs> um, I think we can move to. I didn't introduce myself. I'm uh, Connor McGrady. I'm the dean of the college here at Foreign College Park, and I'm, I'm chairing this evening's discussion. So uh, some of you know me, but for those of you who don't, okay. So we're going to start. Uh, uh, we have four presentations, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Kathy Fitzgerald. Uh, Kathy Fitzgerald, PhD, uh, is an eco-social artist, researcher, and educator. Originally uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have a strong presence from Aotearoa this evening, and uh, this will, I'd say, probably shape the conversation quite a bit as well. She now lives in Ireland, the home of her ancestors, uh, a founder of the online Premier, uh, i.e. .ie Ecoversity, Kathy is a popular speaker in ecological art practice, eco-literacy, and an accredited ESD transformative learning and earth charter educator. In 2009, Kathy was part of the UK RSA Art and Ecology Network and attended the inaugural International Culture Futures Summit held alongside the 2009 Copenhagen UN Climate Summit. In 2017, she was an NUI Galway Moore Institute visiting fellow, and Kathy is also a research fellow here at Barn College Park. So if you can uh, just join me in welcoming Kathy.
and I just Kia ora. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so delighted to be um, talking to you all. And this is a very special presentation. Um, I don't often get to talk about what drives my work. And I lived in Aotearoa for the first 25 years of my life. So, um, and, and the other 25 years here in Ireland, I'm lucky enough to have both uh, citizenship in both of these wonderful island nations. So, just a quick overview, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be talking for 10 minutes and I thought I'd draw from my own uh, creative practice to talk about some of these ideas. Um, I'm going to think, think and share a, a little bit um, about how I got interested in rights of nature, environmental law, and more recently uh, values education for this big cultural shift we're all starting to experience. And I conclude fluency and holistic values guiding rights of nature and environmental law are equally of value and importance to everyone's creativity and art education and cultural policy. So we can inspire ourselves, our learners um, uh, towards personal collective and planetary well-being. Before I start, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that uh, all adult uh, New Zealanders are encouraged to learn their whakapapa, their genealogy. And this means to acknowledge and give thanks to uh, the rivers, the forests, the lands, the good air. My family, particularly my mother, who was so interested in uh, genealogy, she got my Irish passport for me. So I, I'm rooted to two places. And um, I also like to acknowledge my grandfather who was born at sea. So I'm connected to these sort of different parts of the world but it's given me an underlying ecological worldview. And I really very grateful to have that. Uh, I'm not very fluent in it, but um, every opportunity I give to give a, a public talk, I like to acknowledge that. So recognizing more sort of expansive eco-social values to adva advance rights and actions for nature arose very slowly in my creative practice. And just to give you a brief synopsis, since 2008, through my Hollywood forest story work, I creatively explored how one could adopt new ecological forestry practices to transform monoculture tree plantations into thriving permanent forests. And that's an image of it there. It's only two and a half acres. It's the smallest close to nature forest in Ireland. As eco art practices are holistic and welcome experiential like being in the forest, contemplative and spiritual ideas, aesthetic, new ideas of um, forest science and traditional ways of knowing. They're valuable as they invite us to ask how to live well with the wider earth community. However, as I grew to care and love this little wood, I wondered how I could protect the forest into the future for its own sake, for my family and all other inhabitants that depend on it. So I began to ask myself some questions and quite often um, ecological art practices would be known as question led practices. I came across some land artists who thought about copyright, copywriting land projects, but I felt that was um, a pathway I didn't really want to take. It seemed to perhaps further colonial ideas of ownership and um, not the best care for land. I asked an Irish environmental lawyer, Gabriel Tulin, how I could protect my forest and the way that I was hoping to maintain this sort of new ecological management into the future. And he said, I could only suggest provisions for this type of care for my forest and my will, that there was no legal safeguard that in the future, this little forest would be cut down. So it was quite, uh, and that's similar all over the world um, as far as how we think about industrial forestry. I was blogging around that time and one of my followers uh, told me about the Scottish uh, uh, environmental lawyer, sadly she's no longer with us, Polly Higgins, and she was exploring the legal duty of care for non-human realms under the banner of ecocide law. She was uncovering work that has been around uh, in law circles since the 1970s, and she advanced the missing global law to prevent the crime of ecocide. Now that may be a new word for a lot of you. It arose during the Vietnam War um, to describe the effects of Agent Orange on forests that continues to poison 
peoples there with deformities, um, sadly, and it's also still in the system of forests. Um, so it's, I think Polly was really ambitious. She was trying to uh, equate um, this type of law on the same level as genocide, because she said, if we don't have an environment, it will lead to wars, it will lead to breakdown, and we won't has, have a peaceful life. I also noticed rights of nature arising from frontline indigenous peoples around the world, from Ecuador and Iceland, but from my home country of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I was so thrilled. Um, and there were, um, I suppose, rights developing for the forest to have its own legal entity and for rivers. Um, there was uh, efforts for the UN to recognize rights of nature as well. And you can read about that in Hugh's exhibition. These are all part of a paradigm shift away from enlightenment to ecological worldview thinking. So it's, it's a very slow process. Um, in the dominant culture, we've been thinking um, and having ourselves at the top of the pyramid for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, just very briefly, and you can read about uh, my activities in my online book on the Apple Back Bookstore. Um, but over time, as I got more confident about looking after this forest and I collaborated with foresters and other professionals, I found myself, even though I'm quite introverted, standing up for the Green Party to argue for this new type of forest management along with others. And then I also found myself twice standing up to alert the Green Party about the international law of ecocide that's developing. And I've put forward, I cannot guarantee it, but I'm hoping that in the Citizens Assembly for Biodiversity, that there'll be a presentation made by Stop Ecocide International. So all over the world, young people, indigenous people mm -hmm. are coming out to think about um, this real, I see deep rooted sense that something is drastically wrong and we are running out of time. Uh, the pictures in the middle are from last week, people in Europe, particularly the youth, uh, protesting and trying to say we need stronger laws. Um, this, these areas are quite complex. Um, I pick them up sometimes in my work and then I go away again and things, I, I'm noticing such a groundswell. Um, in Ireland as well, Donegal County Council um, was the first in the Republic here to adopt rights of nature. And I found uh, some short films that would suggest even in the north of Ireland, there's more activity. So a thought that I'd like to leave you with is that if, if you're part of the dominant culture and you begin to develop an ecological worldview, that you begin to realize that the future has a very ancient heart. Indigenous leadership based on generational cultural wisdom that maintains all life as sacred is humbling and important because indigenous peoples tend the remaining 85% of the most biodiverse regions in the world. So indigenous cultural and creative practices maintain these holistic values to promote enduring environmental care and social justice together. This reminds communities to live and act respecting because all life is connected. These are just some of the books that I refer to in my teaching. I'm sure many of you may have come across Braiding Sweetgrass. The first one, Tending the Wild, is by an ethnobotanist with a coder at the back explaining how important cultural and creative practices are for maintaining um, this sort of holistic um, and ecological well-being in communities. Uh, Michael Cronin is from Trinity College. He's written about the importance of the Irish language um, and ecology. And uh, 32 Words for Field is by Munkin McGann, a very popular book and his Instagram channel has exploded with interest in I think the Irish diaspora for these older feelings and sensitivities to the natural world that are still, in, that still imbued in the language. So communicating new uh, cultural values for this sort of expanded way of being in the world means our creative intentions have a huge role to play to in inspire people to live in better ways. Um, and what indigenous communities have long understood, neuroscience confirms, we need facts, but we also need to be shown and being inspired with our hearts and our emotions. And I think people who are in the creative um, disciplines have a great sense, um, maybe an intuitive way to bring quite difficult subjects like this to, to um, their communities and audiences. 
And then if we ask ourselves, what do these beyond urgent times ask of us? I would suggest having looked at this area for the last decade or so, that the first step might be just gaining a fluency in what these expanded values might be. Um, this falls under the banner of education for sustainable development. And over 25 years ago, people from all different faiths, different cultures, um, it wasn't a, a top-down thing, but it was a people's movement came together to develop the Earth Charter. It still offers a really good conversation starter for people of all faiths. Um, it's very inclusive. And there's a little children's Earth Charter for people who are maybe just five years old. And I've had the great pleasure in seeing artists using the Earth Charter to bring quite complex ideas, but also to, to bring environmental and social justice ideas together. They're often cherry picked as they, you'd see in the news. And I just end that I've been excited to share that one of my uh, students has translated the Earth Charter into Irish. And I was really delighted that um, when I first came across the Earth Charter, it was a Maori elder, um, Pauline Tongiora, as she was involved right at the start. I don't think it's actually that well known in New Zealand. And I thought, oh, there's another link back to home again. So one day I'd like to see the Earth Charter in Maori as well. So um, just to, this is my final slide and thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in this, if you're concerned about your future, if you want to be grateful for the air that you breathe, the trees that you know, supply us with birdsong and fuel and that, you can be an ally for, for young people, for indigenous people by joining some of these organizations like the Earth Charter. You can sign up as an institution for a school, as a university, for a local authority, for your business. Um, you can join the Stop Ecocide campaign. Um, and then you can also investigate your own cultural lineage, the wisdom that may be in your own people's background that's attached to the places that you live. So I'll leave it with, um, with that. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to encourage everyone to you know, we'll have some questions and uh, have some questions uh, and, and some points for discussion. We're going to do that at the end uh, after the presentations. And uh, as I say, you know, it's the three minutes is a conversation. So, so, uh, so next up, um, uh, I'd like to introduce Eileen Hutton. And uh, Dr. Eileen Hutton is a visual artist whose practice aims to generate reciprocal relationships with the more than human world. And in the process, create replicable, mo replicable models for informed ecological actions. Her studio practice incorporates purpose built habitats, alternative photography processes, scientific methodologies, and community based workshops as a means for this practice to become inclusive and a collective process of uh, curiosity and engagement um, to fo that focuses on a discussion on biodiversity and the natural environment. Eileen is a member of uh, faculty here at Barn College Bar, colleague, and she's also currently uh, a member of the Roots for the Future, uh, a radical climate thinking group formed by artists in association with the Project Arts Centre. Her work is supported by the Arts Council. So, join me in welcoming Eileen. I'm gonna just look and then I'll, I'll start the PowerPoint there. Yes, um, yeah, thanks very much for joining us all here today. And thank you to Hugh and Connor um, for the invitation. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant to be kind of amongst this cohort. Um, so yeah, when uh, the, I think the kind of invitation was first generated, Connor mentioned um, a manifesto of sorts and that really got me thinking I have a, a great love for the modernists um, and their manifestos. So I thought I might write a manifesto of sorts. Um, I'll be brief and then I'll, I'll give you a few examples of my own work. So thinking about the rights of nature, the recognition that the earth, all ecosystems and every natural community has the right to exist, flourish and regenerate their vital life cycles. 
like I think we are all on board with that. Um, it's also the adoption and implementation of legal systems that recognize, respect, and enforce the rights of nature. And my first thought coming across this idea was that's necessary. And I mean, given the current state of the planet, this is clearly necessary. But how have we gotten to a place where recognition and respect for our planet and all of the other more than human species must be legally dictated in order to protect them so that they can continue to exist? How have we gotten to a place where we can't see that we are a part, only one part of a wildly complex, pulsing, vibrant, interconnected system? Where I think solely as an individual, first and foremost, and not part of a collective body, human or otherwise. Some scholars argue that the action of valuing the singular above the collective, this prioritizing the individual began with certain types of thinking, most often associated with the rationality, the intellectualization of the enlightenment. For all of the advances of this enlightenment, I would also argue that we've been left with significant burdens, knotty problems that need solutions. One of the most, one of those impairments I would argue is embedded in our day-to-day -day language and the fact that some of our most commonly accepted and used words and phrases are the ones that lock us into tired patterns of behavior and thinking. They are words that create dichotomies, paired opposites, compartments, rigid structures, nature, culture, urban, wilderness, she, he, us, them, me, you. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that these ideas don't exist, but rather that these boundaries, these hard lines between life, between them don't. Life exists on a range of continuums. Did you know that the human cells make up only 43% of the total, a human being's total body count? The rest of our DNA, our bodily DNA is comprised of bacteria, virus, fungi. Language has the potential to lock us into false dichotomies, reductionist categories that eliminate the complexity, the entanglement, the tentacular potential as Donna Haraway might say. It matters what stories we use to tell stories. If we are given a template, a framework for life that is overly rational, overly sterile, we not only perpetuate these flawed patterns, but we lose the magic. We lose the potential, the flux, the darkness, the beauty of life. So coming back to the idea of the rights of nature, we know that environmental laws enshrined in governmental legislation are about regulation, commodification, the word objectification comes to mind. But there are also measures in place set for conservation and sustainability. Sustainability, that word is used often as a gold standard of sorts, but let's pick it apart a little bit. A simple definition of sustainability being that which is able to be maintained at a certain level or rate. If you were asked to think of your most significant relationship with another human or group of humans, and then asked to describe how you would describe the quality of that relationship and you answered sustainable. I would argue that that might indicate a potential trajectory or longevity to that relationship, but it does not speak to the vibrance, the vitality, the regenerative or even expansive potential for that relationship. And yet this is what's held up as admirable aims of industries and institutions. <laughs> and I think we can do better. To be clear, this is not a call for limitless growth born out of a capitalist neoliberal system. It is about exploring other potentials, perhaps circular economies, perhaps a degrowth model. And so we are given the rights of nature as a way to catalyze a paradigm shift. It is becoming a revolution in perception and language that we take our place along, alongside other species and ecosystems. And it is inspiring to be living in these times of radical change. It is a bright spot in a sea of relentless media-driven narratives of climate disasters. That is not to say that we should turn away from what is happening. Rather, again, as Donna, Donna Haraway says, we stay with the trouble. Or maybe as Rebecca Solnit says, hope. It is important to say what hope is not, is not a belief that everything was, is, or will be fine. There is evidence all around us of tremendous suffering and tremendous destruction. 
The hope that I am interested is about broad perspectives with specific possibilities, one that invites or demands that we act. It is not a sunny, everything is getting better narrative, though it may be counter to the everything is getting worse narrative. You could call it an account of complexity, an uncertainty with openings. So this time calls that calls for an embrace of hope punk. And I would propose that we don't look to the rights of nature as only the only panacea that we've been waiting for, that we proceed with wisdom and caution, that we listen, that we hold space for. The rights of nature, after all, is a human construct, speaking for those who don't have a voice. And I think we can agree that human-centric thinking, the false separation between human beings and nature, that speaking on behalf of others rather than opening space for them to speak for themselves can become problematic quite quickly. So I offer two other paradigms alongside the rights of nature to think about how we move forward, that of queer ecology and that of speculative ethics. Queerness, queer ecology is an academic mode of thought combining queer theory with environmental studies with the goal of diversifying our narratives of the natural world. Queerness in ecology is a concept broader than sexuality or gender identity. Queer ecology asks us to abandon ideas of human exceptionalism and anthropomorphism, and instead urges us to see ourselves as unique parts of a complex and interworking system whose patterns and processes are different from our own. It deconstructs dualistic notions of human and nature. It abandons sterile, ca sterile categories compartmentalized thinking, hierarchical knowledge structures, and makes room for the mysterious, the fluid, the unpredictable, and the magical. I would also point us to speculative ethics as a way to turn away from a human-centered perception of life and to cultivate a relationality of deep interdependence and care. It's not just that we are related, but it's the nature of that relationship that's important. Maria Pugue de la Bella Casa challenges conventional notions of care discusses its potency, its potential to radicalize our relationship to the more than human world, holds it as an ethical and political obligation where we are responsible for and responsive to the more than human world. Care as a radical act of commitment that necessitates empathy, listening, and being present with. And so I'll show a few examples, about five minutes um, just to share with you. Yeah, sorry, could you, oh no, I think I've got it now. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, technology, but I love it. How am I gonna do this? Okay. Um, going to have to shut that down as well. Yeah, so um, we all know that there are multiple points of entry for thinking of and engaging with climate science. In order to navigate this rapidly evolving sea of information, I've created a matrix to help guide my practice and research. About this kind of, I suppose this anchors and the examples that I show are the ways that I kind of think about empathy, a multi-species perspective, I work through purpose-built habitats as a means to cultivate intimacy without proximity and as a way to support local biodiversity. I implement citizen science and participatory projects as a way to cultivate agency and connectivity. My practice centers on the notion of ecology in the broadest sense as a study of relationality and interconnectedness between the human and more than human world. Living across from Mullock Reeland, a 125 acre woodland in County Kildare has pushed my thinking with regard to managed landscapes, the rural, what might be considered wild, as well as notions of fragmentation and connectivity. This body of work titled Leaf Miner Works developed as a result of these daily walks in Mullock Reeland woods. 
For those who don't know, certain species of micro moths, sawflies, and beetles lay pin sized eggs on the underside of leaves. And when their larvae hatch, they feed on and grow inside the leaf tissue, creating visible patterning known as leaf mines. For this body of work, I gathered over 100 leaf mines and digitally scanned the leaves, enlarging the prints by 15. The overlaid red line is a drawing created using GPS technology, tracing the walks and explorations I took with my toddler. As both insect and human being, we inhabit the same woodland. As mothers, we tend to young, tracing the life with the physicality of our bodies, but at vastly different scales and temporalities. It is the convergence of our drawings, though, which points toward what Donna Haraway would articulate as an entangled, multi-species becoming. For this interactive and participatory project, I set up a mini pavilion centered on direct encounters with the native Irish black honeybee. Six microscopic photographs and wooden boxes prompted conversations about the fascinating anatomy of honeybees. Magnifying glasses were provided so that people could closely observe the honeybees contained within the observation hive. The work facilitated members of the public to develop skills of eco perception as we listened for the soft, steady hum of the 10,000 bees contained in the hive, as we tuned into the warm smell of honey emanating from the delicately brittle honeycomb and frames, as we shared stories and memories of these enigmatic pollinators. I also created a series of solar powered bee sculptures attached to wearable beekeeping gloves. When brought into the sunlight, the bees vibrate, simulating the sensations of feeling honeybees emanating their warning buzz. The solar powered bees were made in part as a response to Harvard's research into autonomous flying micro robots that are capable of industrial crop pollination. I first became interested in the potentiality that I could build or sculpt with more than human species and was particularly moved by the idea that a collaboratively created sculpture could simultaneously cultivate interspecies communication between humans and birds and support surrounding biodiversity. And so I built and located four nesting boxes designed to lure blue tits and great tits as central points around the Glucksman. Within each nesting box, I placed a small fiber sculpture made from sheep's wool and dyed with locally sourced materials. I used blackberry, sorrel, bracken, and oak gall. The hard to find dye stuff, the oak gall is a potent symbol for one of the many entangled relationships between insects and plants. This body of work seeks to conflate the external and, in and internal spaces of the gallery, attempting to equalize and account for other species, namely birds that make their home alongside other human beings. It seeks to materially join birds, sheep, flora, trees, and humans to make visible the invisible entanglement of being. More recently, I have been thinking through and with fungi. Again, there are multiple points of entry possible, but this type of active and responsive research allows me to cultivate a relationship with the more than human world, to think with biological systems that have remediation potential and to embrace ideas of transience and ephemerality. These images of fungi generated sculptures explore the potential of mycelium to become a sustainable living sculptural material. Working closely with fungi in this way expands my understanding of how mycorrhizal relationships can act as a potent source for translation and transformation. When I first undertook the soil project residency, the country was still in a phase of 5K travel restrictions. In order to develop a participatory project, that prioritized direct engagement with soil, albeit remotely, I devised a postal art project. Over 100 people from around the island gathered, sensed, identified, and returned soil samples to me. And I began to trace the connections between individuals who reached out to take part in the project, pinpointing these relationships onto the general soil map of Ireland developed by Chagask in 1980. I could see relationships unfolding. <clears throat> between people and communities engaged with permaculture, organic food production, between artists and citizen science. From each of the individual soil samples returned to me, I created a chromatogram. By absorbing and diffusing minute particles of soil, the light sensitive filter paper creates a soil portrait of sorts, 
It becomes a formally beautiful as well as useful way to assess the soil for organic matter, biological diversity, minerals, and hummus. The individual chromatograms were then installed as part of a large scale material soil map that approximated each particular location's soil composition. This collective mapping process was in part by, inspired by Anna Singh, author of The Mushroom at the End of the World, who asks, how does a gathering become a happening that is greater than the sum of its parts? And finally, as a way to share my process for appropriating scientific methodologies and integrating phenomenological experiences as a means for making art, I facilitated a chromatography workshop. The workshop, this workshop template becomes a means for my practice to extend beyond the studio, to become an inclusive collective process of curiosity, engagement and agency. And I'm in the process of scanning the chromatograms and then returning each soil sample an image, an archival image back to each participant so that they have a record of their soil samples. Um, and that's it, thank you very much. Hey. And uh, I'd just like to uh, welcome now uh, Keith, a word uh, via Zoom. Uh, uh, do we? We can see it's on the screen, and this is all. Uh, Sorry, Keith, we're just switching on one second. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so after the introduction, we want to switch the monitor around. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so Keith, uh, after the introduction, we're just going to turn the screen around so you can, you can see the audience. Um, but I'll start by, by uh, with the introduction. So uh, Keith Woods is uh, a heke, uh, an elder of the Nazi Rangi people who live on the southern slopes of Mount Ruapehu and sent on the central north island of uh, Aotearoa. Uh, sorry, how do you? Aotearoa, thank you. <laughs> I'm butchering the language, sorry. Uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, Nati Rangi being the local Maori tribal people who belong to the land in that area. Aotearoa is the Maori name for New Zealand. For New Zealand. Uh, his work has been involved uh, and being an advocate and a voice for the natural world in their tribal area, working to restore water to several streams and rivers flowing through Nati Rangi sacred lands. For these efforts on restoring water, which had previously been diverted for power generation, and for his work on environmental advocacy and mentoring, Keith and his wife Mercia were nominated for a Green Ribbon Award in 2016. The awards celebrate environmental achievements in Aotearoa, New Zealand. He mentors young people in the Kiwi Forever Conservation and Cultural Program since his founding in 2005. Keith also acts as a cultural guide for groups visiting the Nati Rangi Ruapehu area and with his wife run cultural conservation and environmental programs. Quote, introducing and reconnecting people with our natural world as we see it through the eyes of our heart, end quote. If you please uh, welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Keith. A kia ora no tato, e mihi ana kia koto, a tahu kainga, e mihi ana, e mihi ana, a mihi ana kia koe ranginui e tuihu nei. O papa tu no ku e taka to ake nei. <coughs> Ana me ngā tua, a to waidua, o ngā tangata. Ana e mihi ana kia koutou, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a kia ora nō tātou katoa. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, so, yes, my, my mihi and acknowledgements there on behalf of our native language 
in te reo Māori is just um, acknowledging yourselves there in Ireland and acknowledging the realms that um, underpin our existence on this planet in terms of humanity, the universe, our planet, and the realms that are all the different layers of the possibilities within our culture, within our environment, within our tile, within everything that we are. Um, so in just um, being apart from the other side of the world, um, we have just literally yesterday celebrated the start of our Māori New Year, which we refer to as, as uh, Matariki, or for our people in Ngāti Rangi, um, we, we also acknowledge the, the stars of Puang. So it's a very lunar-based um, system, a system that's kind of been, I guess, replaced by another system as the Western European world has uh, colonized our part of the Pacific. Um, but it's the first time that our nation of Aotearoa, New Zealand, as a nation has actually created a public holiday and celebrated um, that element of things. So for ourselves within Māori, that's quite a huge significant step um, because it's starting to uh, reach out beyond the colonial issues um, into the reality of what our world is. Um, so for ourselves in our, our journey, now I noted before that you know, we're part of the Ngāti Rangi people, um, the indigenous people here on the southern slopes of Rupehu. Um, and so we belong to this land. And so for us, the land doesn't belong to us. It, we belong to it. We belong to the tile. We belong to everything. We are part of this beautiful holistic landscape of diversity and everything that we are. And so in our creation stories, mankind was the last to be created. And all of the, what I would call our, our elders, our tuakana, all of the elements within the, um, the different worlds, whether that's you know, aquatic life, the terrestrial life, our rako, our plant life, animal life, all of those things were here before us, creating an environment where we could survive, where we could exist as a species. And so for us, each day we acknowledge that hierarchy. Now, Kathy very well earlier on mentioned about wakapapa. Now our genealogy, that's not just our family tree, um, but that's how we understand the concepts of evolution. Physical evolution, what we call spiritual evolution in terms of wairua, the manifestation of energy. Um, all of these very modern words that try to describe what we would hold on to and have within our own language. Because our language uses words and describes concepts that are beyond the translation um, into English and to other languages. A language that came from the world around us, the natural world around us, that spoke to us, not into the intellectual landscapes of our head, but spoke into the waidu of the spiritual landscapes of our heart and our spiritual being. Because it's through those elements that we are connected and one whole being across our planet. And so that's how we exist. The physical elements, I think um, one of our speakers touched on just how small our cellular structure and physical structure is and the great wisdom that we actually carry of all of these parts within the water, within all of the things that exist within our being that we're still trying to analyze, trying to find out, 
trying to bring down into its individual little bits because we have this intellectual desire to want to know all of these things. And we do know all of those things within the DNA memory of our wakapapa because water holds that and carries that. The evolution of life, the memory of life, the cellular memory, again, all of these modern words that um, try to dissect and understand what, is, what just is. And so when you live in a space in a time and try and keep that space and understand that and sit quietly in the realms of nature with our relations, with our fellow beings in the same energy that they share with us, then we can learn the value of what is needed for our species to survive. The value of that connection, you know, for Mercy and I, in our journeys and trying to work with people is to help people to remember to connect, to remember to be quiet, to sit and to watch and to internalize and bring into ourselves those ancient things as each of us were peoples that belong to a land. Wherever we are, you know, as humanity is spread out across the globe, and we've been, I guess, re-educated, maybe brainwashed into more industrialized um, machine type environment, where it's the nature of what the machine needs and not what we need as the individual parts, but the collective part of the wholeness of what our world is, our natural world is. So we, tend, we have this language where it's something that we're not part of. We have this language where we talk about you know, ecology or the natural world as it's something that's over there. And it's right here because we're very much a part of that. And again, because of our consciousness, we have such a huge part to play in how we can alter and change those things. Yes, and um, my wife's just reminded me, as she most eloquently does, that our wahine, that our, our woman, are the closest beings have that closeness to Papa Tūnuku. Papa Tūnuku be now named for Kaya, Grandmother Earth, to our planet, for ourselves and our people, and our wahine, other leaders in helping us to remember and helping us to reconnect, helping us to be, because they bring life into this world. They are the generators of life, the sacred holders of that belonging to the earth, um, all of these things. And, and so for ourselves, for people that have come on our programs, I'd say 85% are, are wahine because they're already connected. And so we, we encourage that. We encourage that shift and that um, maybe that move away from paternalism towards the matriarchal need and governance and decision-making um, for our world and for ourselves to, to be and survive. And so when I think of Kōrero about the rights of nature, and don't get me wrong here, um, because I think all of these movements and the groundswell of discussion and a movement back towards who we truly are, are really beautiful things. However, it's ironic that we have the presumption that we're going to, you know, I think when I heard the rights of nature, the corridor or well, the discussion that was coming to me was Grandmother Earth was nature saying, well, when did I give away that right? 
who who presumes to have that right beyond me? Didn't I give you life? Don't I provide for everything that you materially need? All you have is your spiritual energy. The rest I provide for you. Which kind of comes back to our um, understandings about the hierarchy of where we sit and things and acknowledging and respecting and looking after our environment, our tile, as we would refer to it, um, and just how critical that is, not just for our survival, but for all of the, the beings that require that as well. Because every time we're distorting or hurting them, then we're actually hurting ourselves. So um, there's that journey again. And even for those that look to ourselves in Aotearoa, um, for the work that's been done to create legal personality for our Awati Awatupua, the Wangani River, um, again, as, as an Indigenous people that live and love in that river environment, that look at the river as being a whole and complete and living person, being. I, I guess we can't quite have the right word for that um, because it's more than that. It's as though you're demeaning the, the quality and nature of Iatua, Wairua, Tipua, or the very elemental um, descriptions of things that bring life and sustenance into our worldview, into our view of who we are. Um, and yet, our people have. When I talk about our people, uh, our Ngāti Rangi people, my genealogy relates back into the Wawani River as well. We've spent time doing work um, around that particular river in our early years um, that our people have had to come up with an innovative way to try and create credibility for the elements that are around us so that we as humans can assign value to that and just stop the destructive nature that we have just to feed the machine. Um, and yet that's been held up around the world has been a stunning example of making a shift in a different direction. Just like the many legal parameters that are trying to give rights and legal law um, to much of our environment and much of our natural world. Um, for me, it's always been there's the LAW law and the more important law is the LORE law that relates to who we are and what we truly are. So stepping back to find those things, to look into the indigenous practice and culture where many of our people are still living in those systems, um, which are trying to establish and maintain and keep balance about what we do in an environment that's already balanced and kinder and is always it's always creating, developing, evolving, um, being what it is. And so I, I do, we, we encourage people to take time out um, and sit by a stream in a river. Put your feet in, put your hands in, watch the current, hear the song of the river and let its language talk into your heart, into the vibration of who you are. Because the water inside of ourselves resonates with the water that's outside of ourselves, the water that's currently all around us in the many elements that it is. Yes, because we have a cordial. Um, 
e riri kau mai te awa, ko te awa ko wau, ko wau te awa ko te, ko te awa ko wau. Um, which means, you know, the river, or the great river that flows from the mountains to the sea. I am the river, and the river is me. So, um, so that brings into view just that we're not separated from these things. And our humanity, the only thing that really separates us is our mind and our consciousness. But we are very much a whole part of the whole of everything. So, um, so I think that's you know, my cordial to bring bring into us and to share with us um, this morning where we are you know, at the eve of another year. And in our, our culture at that time, during Matariki, Matariki is the, the nine stars of the Pleiades constellation. And when it rises, and comes back into sight um, in Aotearoa, that starts our new um, our new year. And so at that time, we take time to acknowledge the passing of those that we've lost physically from our lives and to send them on into the stars and to let go of all of the things um, that have been in the last year to gather and to contemplate and to look into the stars to see what the stars tell us of what the new year will bring. And then to take that and reset ourselves for the future, to look into all of the elements that provide for us, whether it's our forests, our gardens, our oceans, our rivers, the things that sustain us materially, and to ask of them to look after us and to give back to them an offering of ourselves and our heart. So on the eve of that, that connection of being part of the symposium, um, it's an alignment in itself from, from my perspective. So, um, I'll leave that there and pass it over to the to the Ropu and um, we'll see what questions come up later on. Noreda mihi ana ke koutou, a te nga koutou, a te nga koutou, a ki aro no tātou katoa. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thanks for that. And um, just continuing our presentations, last but uh, by no means least, uh, I just I like to welcome Hugh Pocock, who is the exhibiting artist, as I say, with the exhibition No Man's Land, and really who is the catalyst for this evening uh, and this morning uh, events, uh, the conversation as well. So, uh, Hugh. Uh, was born in Aotearoa, if I pronounced it right that time, <laughs> and raised in the United States, England, and Aotearoa, Aotearoa. Working across media, Hugh creates works that explore issues surrounding the Earth's natural resources and society's relationship to the production and consumption of energy. Uh, he's exhibited internationally uh, across the US uh, and the former Soviet Union, Germany, and China. As a faculty member of MICA and as a founding coordinator uh, of the minor in sustainability and social practice and the studio major entitled Ecosystems, Sustainability and Justice. Hugh is also co-facilitator of the Global Ecology Studio, taught annually here at Foreign College of Art. So if you just join me in welcoming.
Yeah, all I see is myself here. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll take, uh, uh, hello, everyone. It's really good to be here. I'm going to keep my uh, comments kind of brief, mainly because uh, most of what I have to say is in the show. And, uh, um, but, and this is just really so, I think the collective conversation is really more important than any form of singular statement. So the uh, comments of my colleagues and to be here and uh, with so much with Keith uh, and you being here uh, is just so deeply, it's more important to have a collective voice than an individual voice. So uh, this is really, really good. And um, but I would really like to say thank you to the Burren College of Art. Uh, and uh, for the opportunity to have the show here. Um, uh, I've been uh, coming here to teach the uh, uh, Global Ecology Studio for about seven years. And um, so the, the Barnes had a profound uh, impact on, um, on myself and my work. And it's such a great home for developing work that is around um, uh, uh, ac acknowledgement of the power of nature. So, uh, and uh, Connor, thank you so much for all, all of your support for bringing the show around. So, um, yeah. Uh, so um, again, yeah, most of my, my work is in the show. Uh, that really, I, I sort of, someone was like, I was like thinking, uh, like art making is kind of like the attempt to try to explain oneself, you know? Um, and uh, so I try to think of like, as an artist, what am I trying to explain? And um, uh, some of it is that uh, if you're here uh, and um, uh, online, um, you're probably, as I am, painfully aware that the Western European project of uh, legal ownership of property and nature has failed. And uh, we're living now in the outcome of this massive failure that's going to just destabilize the future for a long time. And we're all deeply uh, troubled by it. And, uh, and also then we're also living in the space of not knowing uh, uh, how to do something significant about it. And that's just like a really hard space for us to be in. And uh, for myself as an artist and as an individual, as a parent, as a partner, as a, you know, a human being, it's like how to, you know, where to go with things like that. Um, and also how to have, how to have hope. Uh, so, um, uh, diff different ways of activism, of being engaged, doing something, you know, uh, 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 I, I, my early activism was around anti-nuclear uh, uh, work in the 80s, and that was sort of uh, a passive um, uh, sabotage, you know, and getting arrested and destroying property. And um, I, that sort of seemed to work in a certain way. Um, but uh, we've sort of moved into a different realm where the sort of the forces of what's controlling the planet uh, right now seem to be really strong. Uh, the country I live in, the United States, seems to be turning into a white nationalist capitalist theocracy, as we can see from today, uh, uh, what's happened. And, you know, it's just like really, really hard what's going on. Um, so uh, uh, when I, I started to um, uh, learn some about this changing in legal systems around uh, uh, the acknowledgement or the, the legal people working really hard to have courts of law recognize nature as an entity that could be represented in court with personhood. And that struck, and I was like blown away, blown away, because it was like how it's like having your crazy uncle wake up and say, yes, you know, uh, life is meaningful and I'm not the center of things. So um, uh, how could that be? And um, uh, 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 um, the, the movements or the different emanations of it happening have been happening around the world slowly. Um, and uh, Aotearoa New Zealand has been really um, so pivotal and important in doing that. Um, the Te Orawera Act and then the Fanganui Act of recognizing these uh, uh, living ecosystems as, as living legal persons in court where they're represented by the indigenous people. And um, that, and so uh, I was lucky enough to return back to Aotearoa uh, in uh, early 2020, right before the pandemic. And um, I went to Te Orawera, uh, the home of the Tuho people, um, and walked around in uh, Tero where was Tero where National Park, but is now is not. Tero where is itself 
uh, and is uh, uh, stewarded by the uh, two. And, um, and for me, my Western mind, which I am a product of the Western world, I, can, I cannot avoid it. And it's something Keith and I talked about. And I was like, Keith, can I ever escape this? You know? And um, he was kind enough and said, maybe. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, and I'm walk, walking around Terra Oera and being in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ecology that my culture recognized as a living thing and did not belong to me. That was really important because this, uh, the question that I'm driven by is, can I act without taking possession? And is that possible for me to do? And I don't know if it is because it's almost every step I take, I think of me stepping into a place that might be mine, that I can inhabit and make and shape towards my destiny, right? Because I'm a product of this world. So, but there I was confronted with a place that had equal rights as myself. So that was important to me. Um, so, uh, um, and so as, then as an artist, it's like, how do I, how do I engage with that? I do, I, I believe in the, uh, the goal of the harmony, uh, harmonious living with nature, that people and uh, we may be able to live uh, harmoniously with the natural world. I do believe that's the goal. I think we're like, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, Joe Manchin just killed our, our, our ability to maybe work in that, uh, in the, you know, the, the Democratic Senator in uh, the United States. So we have a tough road. Uh, so I feel like uh, um, I, I'd like to evoke um, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. And uh, some of my work is like, can I, you know, there's a certain part of me of a speculative thing that, uh, we, that nature needs uh, weapons and it needs to be able to fight back. And that uh, we cannot uh, assume dominance and our patriarchal thing that we need to um, uh, uh, help nature. Uh, uh, nature is more powerful than us. And um, so maybe it, it needs um, some weapons to fight back. So that's just kind of some of my, uh, that's kind of where I go <laughs> with that. Um, you all, I invite you all to see the show. Um, also, uh, I do think that we need to give up a space, that it's not so much about us conserving space. I think we actually need to um, evacuate humans out of areas. I think that the natural world needs to have autonomy and they can't have autonomy with our, uh, ourselves there at times. So I don't, uh, but that gets very complicated. Um, where's my so you can share. Yeah, I'm just going to show a little bit. You all can. I invite you all to go see the show. But for people on Zoom, I thought I'd just make a little. Uh, I made a little montage. Okay. So let's. Where are you? Montage there. Let's see oh, it's highlight. because it's in a. Okay. Let's see. One second. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Is the sound up? Okay.
Okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop there. We can go back to the, our group conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. So thanks to all of our presenters. And uh, just a quick check, uh, do we have how many we have on Zoom? Good, we have, we have 17 people on Zoom as well. So basically what we want to do is open it up to discussion. Uh, I'll lead off the, the, the question, which is my prerogative as chair. And we'll also take questions from the audience. And maybe at least if you wouldn't mind helping me, if you see, if anyone has a question on Zoom, if you, if you can put it in the chat, we can't guarantee we'll be able to get to all of them, but you know, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. We'll see what we can do. Okay, so I suppose uh, there's so much to think about. I mean, where do you start with, 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 uh, with the partner question? And I'm sure there are many more partner questions than this. But I suppose I want to be maybe a little bit provocative in a way. Um, so that yes, the, you know, the, the rights of nature are a step forward, but as we've seen from an Irish perspective and a colonial perspective, and twice to myself coming from the North, rights are ignored. The law is often abused. It's used to serve vested interests. It's used to serve those in power. By granting or discussing or formulating rights for nature, how can we know that, the, the, that such these rights will be upheld, will be honored? Uh, in terms of like read the question of advocacy, because the law often fails. The law has failed many individuals, many, many, and many communities many, many times. So I'm supposed I'm being devil, devil's advocate for this question, and it's really for the panel. And, and so I fully understand the neat visualization of pushing this forward into the public around to have this discussion, into the public realm to have this discussion. But coming from a, the sharper end of the failure of the law socially and being part of a community that looks it's looking at restorative justice and other ways around the law, because colonial law doesn't work, it doesn't serve our needs. Where do we go with this in a sense? So Kind of a rhetorical question, but hopefully one that might generate some thought. And I'll just throw that open to everybody on the panel. Maybe I can. Um, I actually asked Polly Higgins this question, um, and she said it was a very brief conversation. And we were sitting at Finthorn, uh, which is the environmental centre. Uh, thanks so much. The new story about the new story that we need to tell ourselves about being part of an ecological. Cosmos. And, and she said it's like this, Kathy. If you can think about the rights of children, rights of children, but we also need criminal law to enforce those rights. And she said the rights of nature are similar, and this is why we need the global law that you've signed, the criminal law. So it was, it was a very simple uh, but I still struggle with it uh, going on as well, because I think a lot of the law. It, it's sort of it's a conversation where we come together in agreement with common values. And I don't think we're very fluent about thinking about environmental and social things together. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else from the panel? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was going to kind of make a point where that, you know, like this, you know, it's still, even though we're extending, you know, extending kind of asking these rights to the natural world, it's still coming from this kind of perspective to an extent. And that just to kind of, we just, it, it's one part of it, it's we can't rely on this whole other solution, but that solution comes as an integrated part of the solution. There are other ways to kind of supplement or work alongside this legal uh, implementation of the rights, you know, like, like this kind of radical reframing of how we understand the natural world. You know, I was given, and science um, and these very kind of westernized compartments, you know, and this for me, um, this idea of theory of ecology kind of breaks open that rigid compartmentalization. It's a way to counter my learned understanding of ecology. And this other idea of kind of radical care for me, and, you know, that, and, and radical care, I think it oftentimes gets associated with tenderness, or, or maybe we just care in itself, tenderness is a burden of care, and who we care for and how we care for. Um, and 
and I'm, I'm interested in kind of maybe digging into this notion of care that can be really difficult and that it can be, you know, it's those care becomes those times when you show up for someone or something or other more than human species, when it's difficult, when it's dark, when it's tangled, um, when you're depleted, when it's depleted, but there's there's not a choice, it's a commitment, a long-term commitment. And I, I think that's how we can start to relate to our natural world, that it like we are committed, you know, for better or for worse, we are here and to kind of stand and make space for it that in that kind of that. That relationality. It's not just that we are related or interconnected, but it's the quality of that relationship. And I think care is a really interesting way to frame that. that I Keith, did you have to say on that one? Um, yeah, I think for 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 ourselves, when it the the law side of things. Yes, I, I can agree with you, Connor, that the powers that be have always used the law or created law to suit what the intentions of that is, uh, of what those, whether that's ego, power, or whatever to do. And it's always had a very extractive nature around it to, to do with greed, finance, personal gain across and around the world so when i think you no know, i agree to an extent that there needs to be some legal mechanisms to try and bring into check um just people's desire to keep destroying things but for me you know i'm thinking the law the lor law is a part of an educational thing to help, you know, we, we have two words, kawa and tikonga, um, <clears throat> which kind of explain to people the, the kawa of the natural world or the kawa order is talked about. Um, so that's the natural order of how everything exists and is. And trying to help ourselves, re educate ourselves about how that is through actually connection because we're so disconnected so brainwashed into how this world's supposed to be the picture that's offered through our screens or whatever in terms of marketing and everything is selling us all of this stuff and so we have to be so much more connected to the reality of what's around us um and then to actually be, to action the things and really question and reach out and say, that's not right. So many things we can see is not right, but we don't have a voice. We don't think we have a voice, but yes, we do. Um, and, and to use that, use that voice and action to bring and recreate the systems of power and governance in the world so that it realigns with where it should be. Um, and you know, I think when I look back through the pandemic and with everybody locked down, how our planet just healed herself in six weeks or so. You know, rivers ran clear and blue again as they used to be. And all we need to do as humans is get the bloody hell out of the way, excusing me, the French, and reconfigure how we're doing things. It's, it's, it's not as though it's rocket science. Everybody's talking about it, and then you get the academic world, the scientific world, arguing about whether climate change is a long-term system or short-term system. And, and it's right here now. And yes, indigenous peoples over thousands of years have lived through climate change, lived through ice ages, lived through global warming, but not to the extent of what it is at the moment. And so whether we can survive or not depends on what we need to do as, as, as humans. So, um, so, you know, yeah, I talked about kawatikonga 
is how our practice, how we take the core values that what make us who we are and how we relate to our world and then apply that in practice and protocols in our everyday lives. So again, that sort of translates in terms of how we behave, how we consume things, what we buy, what we do. Um, if we're all making those small steps, we can start to shift things quicker. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a place for law, but I think there's a huge place for education. And you know, shifting the thinking of, of, well, our young people's thoughts, I think. You know, I sit here in Aotearoa and you're listening to talk back radio and um, the older folk on the radio, you can tell they're over 50 or 60 because that's saying, you know, what do these young people know? They haven't lived any part of their life or whatever. What do they know about the realities of life? Now, I still want to drive my Range Rover around and do what I've been doing. But, you know, our younger generations, they know. They're more connected to the intuition of the connection to our earth than many of our older folk are. So they're the ones we need to just actually provide the tools. As you said, maybe, you no, know, the weaponry. Let's not. I think nature's got her own series of uh, weaponry here um, that she just puts out there, and we struggle with that. Um, and we, so, yeah, I don't think we need to weaponize her. She's got the power to do whatever she needs to. Um, Kia that's my contribution to things. Oh, and I guess just one thing for us Zoom people anyway, it's a little bit hard to hear what the panel's saying with, our, with the volume sort of turned up. I'm just struggling to hear that a little bit. So if you maybe talk up a little bit louder. Kia ora. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Um, well, I suppose, just I suppose in the interest of time, but Hugh, did you want to respond? Do you have any was, uh, well, I mean, the, the issue of uh, enforcement uh, is a, really a big deal within rights of nature. Uh, it was one of the first. Uh, Keith, can you hear me a little better? Maybe it's a mic. Oh, it's basically a mask. Yeah, mask. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this not actually directed to anyone in particular, but uh, the city of Santa Monica was one of the first places to be uh, to vote itself uh, uh, vote rights of nature to the land of the city of Santa Monica. And after they did it, they were like, "What have we done? You know, uh, how do we enforce this?" And uh, and inside of an urban area, the idea of uh, granting uh, rates to the natural world of a sit in a city. Was in so complex. They, it was like, what, 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 what's, what's happened? Uh, and so, and who are the representatives and who are the multi generational representatives? But uh, just this past year in Chile, a, um, a river that had uh, been given um, uh, legal <coughs> rights represented itself in court through Indigenous people, and, and uh, a mining company was found guilty of infringing its. Uh, right to flourish, survive, and and um, uh, uh, reproduce, and that that mining company was held liable for it, and then the court actually held up. So it was, and that's one of the first times that uh, uh, that actually it was, you know, uh, whether that's you know going to be, it will not be uniform because yes, as Keith said, that uh, the law is usually uh, 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 perpetrated by people in their own self interest. But yes, hope. Oh. Thanks, you. And I'm just, if you have a question on Zoom, if you wouldn't mind just putting it, if you can, wouldn't mind typing it into chat. Um, we can, so I think that at this point we can uh, we'll just open it up for any questions from the Zoom room uh, and from the general audience. But before that, I think you send there is a question. There's a, well, there's a hand raised by Sinead. Yeah. I would just ask if Sinead, if you wouldn't mind just putting your question, if you wouldn't mind just typing your question in because it's uh... um it's not actually a thing I can type. It's from a book that I read called Rooted by Linda Lynn Har um Har hopped uh, there recently enough. And she mentioned something about commodity and about nature that I thought would be referencing what we're talking about here now. Is it okay if I if I 
if I quote her for a second, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, she basically said that I hear over and o- over and over again, just there recently enough in January, from thoughtful friends and activists that if we don't couch our dialogue about nature in terms of utility and ec- economic value, whether the profit be derived from ecotourism or carbon sequestration or potential for pharmaceutical discovery or growing bored of feet of lumber or even human health, then wild places and creatures will not be saved. As activists, we have tried using the util- 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 utilitarian language of economics in order to protect nature for more than a hundred years and it has not worked. As long as, we free, as, as long as we frame a worldview with language that refers to the wild as a commodity, it will be treated as one. And I suppose it kind of references a lot of what we're, we're mentioning here now, that unless we actually change our economic values within, within the structural interior of our economics and actually bring eco to the forefront of everything that we do, and it was something that I mentioned actually to the Department of Climate and, and Environmental um, whatever they want to call themselves, they change it every two seconds. But um, it's something that I mentioned to them that unless we put it into the heart of everything, I intentionally worked for a company. I'm actually an environmental educator myself, but I intentionally worked with Woody's DIY to see the inner core of what they're actually doing. They're still selling Roundup. You know, we're still dealing with companies that are are as part of our system. And if we don't maybe try and figure out a way of inter or divert uh, intersecting our ideals into these types of companies, you know, that are, are very well known, you know, people on the lower end, all they care about right now is surviving because we don't have our basic needs being met. And if you try to educate people, As an environmental educator myself, I thought over in Canada, and one of the things I always found that worked with environmental education is if you relate it back to the people themselves, if you relate kind of say the likes of the inner core of the tree, the health of the tree, back to the inner inner core of a person and interconnect kind of the interweave our, our way of living into our environmental education, that's what needs to change because I think environmental education is is very is very effective, but there's different methods and different mechanisms that we can use to try and I suppose engage with the people of today because I think there was something mentioned before that we're we're very much unrealistic. We're dealing with people that are very much, you know, like you probably all noticed yourselves, obviously. But do you know, I'm probably speaking to the, the, the you know the converse here, but you know, like is in it's <laughs> it's so hard to kind of I suppose that's where our issue lies is trying to kind of find an avenue to connect with people on a whole level um yeah so maybe i don't know that's something maybe just to to add into the conversation thank you thanks for listening guys absolutely thanks for that and uh, do you want to respond to you? oh no I'll just wait a bit oh, yeah. but that, that also raises the question uh, again of, of economic systems uh and hugh has spoken uh keith has spoken about it and uh, it's really an absolute failure of this. And I didn't, well, everybody's addressed it, just the, you know, the, 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 the neoliberal capitalist model is simply not built for projects. Here we are stuck with it year in, year out. Um, but anyway, that's not a question, it's more just to pick up on that point. But I would, if anyone wants to respond to that point, or do we have any questions, direct questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, so I have a question about sort of something that you mentioned that I think could very well be commented on within everyone's framework of working. Um, Hugh, you mentioned that um, you feel that there needs to be the removal of, of humans from sections of land um, uh, in order for restoration. How do you reconcile that philosophy with the active um, stewardship of land by indigenous groups and restoration groups such as like the Burren program. I'm just curious how you feel those two interact with one another and sort of other people's opinions of um, the exodus of humans from parts of land as part of like your philosophy and your framework. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I can't answer that. I'm going to have to buy over here for the Zoom. The Zoom yes. 
Uh, thanks, Brent. I mean, it's, it's obviously really super complicated and uh, not one size fits all. And also that, uh, you know, uh, 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 indigenous people, uh, uh, native peoples are, um, uh, are uh, have sovereignty uh, in, on the land. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, all people have uh, always, um, there's places um, that are held sacred. And uh, that also, um, I think that the idea of having uh, the non-human species having uh, uh, also <clears throat> the ability to run free and uninhibited uh, uh, and uh, allowed to reproduce without uh, constraint and to migrate is a, is a shared value. Um, I think that if I could sort of like, you know, catch it, that sort of uh, 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 industrialized people uh, need to remove themselves from the land. Uh, that uh, the idea that, that beyond parks and beyond, you know, uh, you know, actually in Russia, there are actually these huge swaths of land that are just left. It's actually some of the um, uh, more, you know, it's kind of weird to say in this moment, but uh, they've actually, you know, uh, have set aside enormous amounts of land that don't have roads going in them. You know, the idea of roadless land, you know, that is just allowed to be, uh, that's, sort of what I'm talking about. You know, the idea of, of uh, land races throughout, in the North American continent, can the idea of buffalo herds being able to migrate, you know, how does that happen? And those herds, you know, as we all know, are essential to native people's way of life. So they have to, they, things have to be gotten out of the way for those animals, the bear, the, uh, the, lion, the mountain lion, the uh, wolf, you know, uh, all those things that create a balanced environment that we've taken their ability to move around. So people have to get out of the way for that to happen. Um, the conversation about the, the relationship between um, uh, European settler community and uh, um, uh, First Nation, uh, Indigenous people. That's then the that's then the work. So that's it. You, just so you know, there, there is a question. I don't know uh, if you keep answering. Well, that's what, this one is <laughs> when you're talking about weaponizing nature. It's a question from Lynn Silverman. From does Lynn this, Silverman. Is it Lynn Silverman. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, mascot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, does this resonate with the idea of eco-terrorism? Yes, Lynn. Absolutely. I mean, I say this in, speculative, in a speculative way, and then um, I also, uh, it's, I mean, as an artist, I try, some of my, the work is this speculative, almost fictional proposition of what would happen if we gave up our hegemony and shared it and turned the weapon, the same weapons we have over to the non-human and how frightening that would be. So, and I like that idea as an artist because I like it because it decenters us as humans. So uh, the idea, I've always loved the idea when the elephants attack the village that has cut down the uh, forest, you know, sometimes the animals fight back. And um, I've often wished that that would happen more. And I'll just say, you know, of course it can't be all the time, but I just say that as an artist, as this piece in me that I just wish that they were given more agency to um, uh, protect themselves. So, defend themselves too. Right, I see. Uh, we have another question from the audience, yeah. Um, how do you guys propose that, like, preserve the environment with like, growing crops and like, the growing number of the population? Because, like, back. 100, 200, 400, 1,000 years ago, there were not nearly as many people. Therefore, there wasn't so much need for space to live. And so, I don't know, like concerning where I live right now in St. George, Utah, it's extremely hard to find anywhere to live because there's so many people that have migrated there for the land, how beautiful it is. And so I just wonder, like, it's only going to keep growing at this rate unless something changes, but how do you guys propose that we keep land untouched and, you know, preserved 
with so many people and a growing need to sustain our population with food and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I, I, I think that's a very complex um, observation and question. And I don't think it's just population. I think um, a big problem with the, the modern culture is we've become addicted to consuming. And it comes back to what we value and, and what we don't value. And we're so alienated from the living world. I think the ecological crisis at its heart is a spiritual crisis. And I think when you start to look at how indigenous people have rituals and ceremonies and some things that are daily sort of in gratitude for the way they live. And then you think about how we live. It's quite a, there's quite a contrast. But I, I don't think we should appropriate from um, indigenous people just willy nilly and just cherry pick. I think we need to go deep down in ourselves look at our own and cultures and so that everybody on the planet gets re-indigenized to to earth do you know so but it's a it's a huge cultural shift because right back from mesopotamia times that conquest consciousness is an anthropologist who's talked about this it's what in the modern world we just live and breathe it we don't we don't actually see that we're doing so it's i think it's going to be a really difficult thing and i think there is a, a positive shift away from the narrative of just endless economic growth if you keep your ears open there's quite a lot of um countries who are talking about um forming um i suppose frameworks for well-being and now and, and it's also it's actually still quite a lot about human well-being but if you look at things like the earth charter they're talking about human well-being but also collective and planetary well-being so it gives you scope to think about well will my action help me will it help my family and will it help the world <laughs> Hello. Um, brief. Um, yeah, um, and maybe just echoing what Kathy said, it's, it is quite complex, um, but there is no kind of environmental justice movement without a social justice movement. It is intertwined and it's interlinked. Do you know, we, we know that the people that are most affected by climate, the impacts of climate change are people that are living like in archipelago communities, um, BIPOC people, indigenous communities, they're the ones that are most affected um, across the board, those who have less access to kind of economic stability and um, kind of what, you know, maybe piggybacking on what Sinead was saying earlier, that it has to be integrated. It's not a separate thing. Do you know like that these systems are interconnected and intertwined? So those, those social justice movements have to coincide with environmental justice movements. Um. Did you want to respond to that one as well? Or? Um, yeah, I think um, I think what um, yeah, absolutely total what's just been said. Yeah. Um, and that yes, the whole nature of it's 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 a very complex sort of situation and I don't think anybody's got the absolute answer and there's sometimes a fear of what you don't know amongst a lot of people but to we don't want to end up being in the place where we haven't got a choice so at the moment we're still at the cusp of being able to choose and start to make different choices about how we do things um and I think, as Kathy was saying, you know, that reconnective process back into our own sense of indigeneity that gave us originally that connection to a belonging to a piece of land somewhere before a lot of us were just dispossessed and the nature of humanity has been the way that it is. Um, so it's finding that individual space and understanding and relationship, that sense of self ceremony, that sense of self um, acknowledgement without plagiarizing indigenous people's beliefs and ceremony, because each of those are tied to the place that they belong to, um, is, is what's needed so that our whole, the structure of our value system is forced to change. 
when we start to think that way. Um, and then I keep thinking that there's billions of us <laughs> and uh, we need to regulate just what we're doing. Nature will regulate some of those things probably as well. Um, so, yeah, for, for me, it's just create, recreating that and that connective space again, um, which many Indigenous people still have and are still holding on to and are, and are quite happy in some ways to share, but also by the same perspective for ourselves at home, the, the impact of colonisation um, means that some of those things, when everything else was stripped away except that, um, we kind of were, were really precious about holding on to that and we're a little bit cautious about how we share our shells with the world. Um, again, what I saw yesterday in terms of the Matariki ceremonies in, in Aotearoa um, was that the start of Māoridom stepping out and sharing with the world, literally, the depths of our relationship with the stars. And I, and I mean that just by our native language being actually translated into English on the screen, which for some of those more ancient um, prayer and ceremony would never have happened before. So that's our people taking a significant risk to put ourselves out there in terms of our relationship to our world around us. And there's no, in my mind, there's an expectation that the world will step up. They don't have to be Ngāti Rangi, they don't have to be Māori. But we need to step up and be the essence of what ourselves is to help look after all of everything around us. So, kia ora Thanks, Thanks um there's a few questions coming through on in the chat room so and i think some resources so before we take another question um there's a few links that have been sent as well so maybe when we make this available through the college website we'll, we'll share the link so thank you uh folks on zoom uh someone shared the uh the facebook page for bernard hopkins for the rights of nature ireland Thank you very much for that. And Katie Holton, who we know very well here at the college, has visited uh, did a lecture last year and has sent a link as well. So thanks, Katie. Thanks for joining. Um, quite a few links. So it's, I don't really have the time to run through them, but we'll, we'll make these available as well. Um, so there's a question here as well, another question from Zoom. So regarding the comment about agency viruses and invasive species, I have absolutely no problem in exercising agency. We make culturally influenced choices about these things. The issue is not just decentering the human, but how we construct and then act on the more nuanced value systems with which we interact with the more than human world. So not a question, more of a comment from Dave Pritchard. Thanks for that, Dave. And there's also um, a question of Wordy's boycott of Roundup, something maybe we can talk about later, but something I feel quite passionate about as well. Before we get to that, can we take another question from the, the audience? Yeah. I, I'd like to uh, say that uh, you yourself made the assumption that the neo capitalist colonial system uh, didn't work or isn't work. Well, I, I think it is, right? Because a small amount of people, mm. point zero, or whatever it is, right? It's working really well. And I'm told now that we are in the fourth industrial revolution and that there'll be substantial changes coming down the track. And I think you should uh, maybe uh, contemplate the notion that if the human as a species, you know, don't forget that we're pretty ruthless, you know, we, that's an easy one to, to, to get up over. And I, I think you should con contemplate the notion that somewhere in the, I would say, not too distant future, uh, when there's no longer a requirement for the exploitation of humans in a neo-capitalistic system to uh, hold on to the concept of, of, 
power, authority, and wealth. So in other words, when the concepts of artificial intelligence and computerization and robotics and so forth uh, move uh, into uh, a wave a, a little bit up the track, then these people that are uh, doing very well with the system that is uh, that they're evolved from, they probably come to the same conclusions as yourself. Like you said, that we need to move off the, uh, the, the bigger patches. I'd remind you in a kind of a way that it was described to me when Ireland uh, was joining the European Union and we were uh, the beneficiaries of lots of billions of pounds and then euros. And uh, the folks in Ireland were to be available for when the nice people from Europe came out to, uh, to run around and to play in the countryside, that we were there as a kind of a service industry to kind of pay back, to look after, you know? And I imagine that it's quite possible, given the way humans operate, that, that the folks uh, who will operate the system will kind of be happy to have a few indigenous people down in New Zealand doing their little language of how are you doing, or a few people in Ireland, a few people here and there around the line, and, and to hold on to the resources. And uh, I'd say, I'd say, guys, you know, you want to uh, reflect and watch out. You might have long more on the planet anyway. It's, uh, five hundred one of you dominating as chairman. Thanks. But yeah, okay, well, we can, thanks for that. Um, is that, we have another, we have another question or is this? Uh, okay, it's some re more references. So are there any uh, specific questions? Yes. And um, in April, we did uh, a walk, uh, a confinement walk, um, to highlight the issues in Southern Mekana. Uh, because uh, in our actions, we've realized that it's under threat from Northern Ireland and fracking, along with the blockade, the big lake on the island, um, all the way down the river with the mining, with um, the Okie Dokie Beach being a drainage park. Um, and, um, like the Algae View, the, the pipeline to Dublin, and um, Arctic Russia destroying um, the, um, thousands and thousands of European eels and salmon. Um, and we've been dealing a lot with um, Ostrich El Nino expansion, which is um, in planning at the moment, um, and Shannon LNG, the fracked gas import terminal in the river, um, and Irish cement. <coughs> Is also used in the river. And um, we realize we can't fight the government with all these issues on our own, and um, that we have to get people on board that they, they need to be connected to the river as a source of water and source of life. Um, so we've been trying to promote that um, for the last few months, um, and we've linked up with all these people both in the state here in Edinburgh. Um, and I hope some more people that I was on the phone the last two days like hoping everybody um, to join us. So I have um, some leaflets if people would like to, to learn more about what we're doing and start a conversation about the rise of the river in Canada. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. I don't know how audible that was on Zoom, but uh, yeah, it's uh, that's great to hear about the work. So please, yeah. Uh, feel free to, to share information. Um, and it's, I suppose just, when, you know, again, I mean, we've had a tradition over the past, if you look at the past decade here in Ireland, it's gone back to this question of direct action, which you, you mentioned earlier. You know, you, you do have Extinction Rebellion, very active uh, globally, but also I'm thinking here locally, it's actually longer, 20 plus years ago we had, actions around the uh, Mullet Moor, just the mountain here in the Burren, which uh, is really for many people considered the heart of the Burren. 
as, as a, almost as a, as a sacred mountain in a way. The Provanda Visitor Center cannot simultaneously mobilize and divided communities. You also had the Shell the Sea movement here about 10 plus years ago, which simultaneously uh, did the same, mobilized and divided communities. I mean, anything, once anything becomes, once action starts, starts to take place in the public realm, you're going to get division. It's the nature of, it's the nature of politics when you, you go against vested interests. And, um, but we have, there's a tradition here on the West Coast of people stepping up. Um, so I hope with, with, with the, the rights, uh, the question around the River Shannon, that there will be interest uh, and then the, the things will, will, will pick up. But again, just, just on that question of, uh, you know, you, you have, this is the sort of idiosyncrasy of the law, isn't it? That you can bestow a right to something, but if you, uh, some direct action is often punishable by the law, but then outside, it's often considered being outside the realms of, 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 of quote, quote unquote decent behavior in a way. So those, you know, those who are passionate about change and are not comfortable with the, uh, the lack of momentum uh, at a government or official level, I mean, participate in direct action and take direct action, also suffer, tend to suffer the full force of the law. So this is back to my original point about not fully trusting the law <laughs> in a way. But uh, anyone would like to speak, I mean, who you did speak about, is anyone else on the panel like to speak? Speak around sharing your thoughts about. I just to yeah, end um, the with, the people, um, with the River Shannon, and you've probably thought it yourself, but um, there's a great opportunity at the moment to for everybody in Ireland to make a submission to the Citizens Assembly for Biodiversity. And just to share um, in France, when they did their Citizens Assembly for Climate and they were struggling, the government was struggling with introducing a carbon tax, they had uh, lawyers from around the world talk about ecocide. They came back with the Citizens Assembly, I think, um, overwhelming support, over 96% in favour of an ecocide law nationally, but also to um, support it internationally at the International Criminal Court. That's why I raised it myself with the Green Party, because there's a precedent. And I think Belgium's followed this one. So that, I know there's always that doubt about change, but the Citizens Assembly is, I, I believe, quite a random selection of of the public. But there's a catchment that way the website for international organizations mm -hmm. and conferences of all religions and faiths. Yeah. And the whole environment uh, and yeah. it's calling for submission. Yeah. And anybody can sit down and say yeah. yeah. I think it's really important. So catch catchment that way yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I think I think it's important also to realize <laughs> 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 I think it's important to realize that, like, um, that uh, uh, what white male society in Europe tried to sequester power to itself originally, and that was only been broken up by force by extending rights gradually outward to um, to women, to children, and to and uh, to end the enslavement of people, and each one, each time of those. As uh, the only way it's come about is by civil action, and sometimes through different levels of civil action, through uh, civil disobedience, through boycott, through uh, non, uh, through uh, different forms of resistance. So every it's they, they don't like to give it up, you know. They uh, want to keep it, so it always has to be pushed. But this, what's weird about this one is that. Um, uh, well, it's for uh, uh, extending right to a non non human entity, which has already happened because corporations are seen as uh, their representatives, their their people, rep they're recognized as as people in courts already. So the whole idea is kind of preposterous that we can't recognize nature when corporations are already recognized in courts of law. So I mean, they snuck that by us, right? Because they own the law. Uh, but uh, but each time it happens, it doesn't happen just because they uh, some they're asked and then someone says yes. So uh, I um, I do think that um, there's levels. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, everyone has to make up their own mind as to what level they're deciding to go to to bring about change. And that's kind of like the thing that's in front of us is to sort of like what 
is it that you're willing to do? And usually it's a, a connected to how much uh, do you have to lose? Thanks, Hugh. Yeah, if I can, if I could just add into that, um, Hugh, um, yeah, for, for ourselves, no, I've been a great advocate for creating allies for our, you know, our Maori sort of perspective, our Indigenous perspective on things um, to get um, non-Indigenous people um, supporting our ideals. So when they're put up somewhere else, we've got other people, other cultures that are supporting those values and things. So I think it's a multidisciplinary sort of how you take action um, to, to force action. The, the legal action, you know, from what I've witnessed in many places, it, it takes action through the court to create legal law precedents to, to win what we need to win. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's a mixture of those things. Um, and also, you know, as a previous speaker was talking about, I couldn't quite capture it all um, about maybe, I think he was maybe suggesting we need to be kind of careful in Aotearoa uh, around the, those that have been successful in the current neoliberal um, landscapes of things, um, of people coming to look to see what the natives are doing and how we're doing what we do and to eco tourism and all of these things and it yeah there's uh the landscape of what that kind of looks like and how you do you change those people who have already actually wrecked the planet to get to where they are can they turn it around and give all their wealth away and change make enough change for the world to be well and allow itself to heal um i think you kind of summed it up in saying no that part of the world doesn't want to change and they'll resist that um yeah that that's about my sort of contribution to things really the older we have, we're getting to the end of our time, but uh, yes, go ahead. Could you ask the other Yeah, the, the question just for anyone on Zoom was around restorative justice. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning looking at alternative forms of justice or alternative ways to mediate when the law fails. And uh, I mean, I suppose the part of the world that I'm from in the north, restorative justice has been used uh, in the, uh, with the failure of conventional law in a sense. But it also goes back to the old Irish legal system, the pre British. The pre colonial legal system here. And we, we you know, so the Brehon laws were very much based on principles around of restorative justice, whereas the British legal system that we inherited in 19, this state inherited in 1922, is punitive law, it's based on punishment. So even when the Irish free state became a republic, it still kept this punitive sense of the law. And I'd say that applies to a lot of European countries. Uh, this idea of the law is, is sort of coming from the language of, of the punitive. But so there's not, so the, in a way, what people have done in the North is have gone back to the Brown laws and they've, they've tried to apply them in a social context to what, you know, and again, there's, there's lots of examples, and I would recommend just doing a little bit of online research, uh, just, uh, looking at just even social problems, not necessarily bigger political problems, but there's also around post peace process. Context has been ways to try to mediate, uh, come to some sort of understanding through, through, through discussion. But restorative justice is very much uh, been tested on a community basis to deal with social problems in the world. Thank you.
I, I don't have any examples of how that might work with regards to the, this idea of when we look at the rights of nature, so I'd be very open to hearing if there are examples or uh, because we're talking about direct action, we're talking about collective action to change. This is something that's emerged for me throughout this whole evening. It's this idea of the collective and the need for collective uh, power in a sense. But um, it is something to think about as well in terms of what, what restorative justice might look like. Uh, through our actions, collective actions or individual actions, uh, in terms of in terms of the natural world. But I'm open to anybody else wants to address that. Let's say something real quick. Uh, uh, just for those of you who don't know, Green Sod Ireland is is working to set aside um, Green Sod Ireland is working to set aside different um, areas of land. I think they've been working since maybe the 1990s, and they've kind of very quietly bought pieces of land and. They're not available for kind of recreation or research. They're just kind of a, almost a, one of the first rewilding experiments um, that nature, the natural world is, exists in its own right for, its own, for itself um, and human beings are part of that. So, um, you know, it's kind of really important models within Ireland that are existing. Um, Green South Ireland is, is one to look at for that. In the, in the United States, uh, there's certain uh, taxes and native land taxes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So, sorry. Was the yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's some in the, in the United States, this might be uh, prevalent in other parts of the world where uh, people are uh, doing uh, native land taxes where uh, you can uh, pay well while you're paying your federal government taxes, also pay into a native native land tax. So then that land, that money then goes to the, uh, um, the uh, sort of a restorative fund for uh, the native people of the area. So in this different, and it takes different forms in different places. It's not like uniform way. So that's, that's one way of restoring. So, because where I live, I'm living on unceded land of native people. So I should pay into a fund to help the, the remaining people of that tribe. Okay, um, we are. Well, uh, just uh, Keith, just suppose. Uh, just uh, do you have any examples of restorative uh, justice around th th this question uh, in your own uh, in your own work or your own uh, actions? Um. No, not not anything specifically. I, I know within the, the justice systems, um, restorative justice in terms of the social side of things has been explored. Um, and it's been questioned very rigorously by the those that are proponents of the penal system. Um, and no, my, my personal view, you've got to learn the lesson. <laughs> if, if the system doesn't help you to learn the lesson, then it's a failed system, and, and often just you know paying money to 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 fix things doesn't help people um, understand what's there. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done in that area. Um, I was kind of thinking the CEO of a corporation that's destroying a river by mining or something. Um, maybe they should have to live beside that river and try and feed off it for. Uh, three months or so without any assistance to understand just why that's unacceptable. Maybe the whole board um, knows some, some sort of uh, things like that itself to help people to understand the reality. I think in terms of some of the actions that we've taken with regards to the en environment and fighting for our rivers, um, what I've noticed is that if you can take those decision makers out of the courtroom, out of their nice ivory castles and take them to the places that are impacted and affected and for them to actually are forced to have an emotional connection, particularly if they're there with like our people and seeing just the emotional harm and the sense of that that's happening. That's, that's where I think we've been. All of the successful actions and there's been heaps of unsuccessful ones but the successful ones, when I think about them, 
have all involved us taking the time to take those decision makers, those judges, um, commissioners, whatever they're called here, um, out to visit these places and basically see the lack of attunement that's taking place. Um, because they can't see that and hear that from the words of lawyers in a courtroom somewhere. So that, that's probably my best advice for ourselves, where, wherever that is. So kia ora. Thanks, Keith. And uh, we're, we're, we've probably come to the end of the, 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 conver the conversation, but I hope, it'll, I hope it's been productive, provocative, inspiring. I know you just have a comment here that uh, it's just sort of a thank you. This is good for the mental health to be surrounded by people who think and feel the same way. So that's encouraging. Um, but I just, all that remains for me to say is to, is to well, we'll, we'll share the, this, it'll be made available on the, on the college website uh, with the links uh, that everyone sees, all well, the links that have been shared in, uh, in Zoom. And to, all it remains for me to do now is to thank, uh, thank your audience online, your audience here in the room, and a special thanks to, to our speakers, to, to Hugh, to Eileen, to Cathy, and to Keith. Thank you so much for being, for being this conversation. And, uh, and, and so just round of applause for everybody. Thank you.